Welcome everyone. We are going to be looking at chapter 16, the rise of industrial America in, Amer in uh, the U.S. between 1865 and pretty much the early 1900s. Uh, this also will start in period six, which does take us from the Civil War up again, like I said, to the 1900s. And the focus is going to be really the transformation of the United States into a more industrialized, urbanized society. We're gonna see the massive migration of farmers and Americans both northwards from the south and also um, eastwards from like, you know, the Midwest. Uh, we're also gonna see a major Western movement as well into the far west, into um, new types of uh, economies like uh, the mining and ranching and uh, homesteading economies. Also during this time period, we're gonna see a massive change politically, socially, uh, economically, diplomatically, just really a lot of change going on from a very more of agrarian American past to a very urbanized and industrialized America in the future. So there's a lot of dynamics here. Um, the period six, the AP does like to test on this a lot. Um, and this typically is a few chapters of the textbook. It's about 30% of the test, and typically you will see at least one writing prompt on this. Uh, in the past, we've had a couple of LAQs. We had a DBQ a few years ago, and almost every year, if you don't get an LAQ or a DBQ, you will get the SAQ. So this is a very tested uh, subject matter and very topic period. So we're going to be starting out with the sources of industrial growth. Where do these things come from? Why did America decide to industrialize so heavily and so easily when it did in the late 1800s. So what sort of were the dynamics that were going on that allowed this to happen? So this whole time period, we're gonna be using this term a lot. So we should know this time period, so where it got its name. The Gilded Age was a phrase coined by Mark Twain. And that phrase sort of embodies this time period because what it means is with gilded, it means a cheap metal that is basically gilded or covered in a very expensive or gold material. So on the outside, America looks really bright and shiny and well-to-do and, and really doing well. But underneath, you scratch off the layer of industrialization and, and, and urbanization, you're gonna see a huge amount of social, economic, and political problems. And that's really what we're gonna be focusing on is like not only the growth of industrialization in America, but also the growth of problems as well. Okay, but where do we get this growth from to begin with? Um, how did this industrialization happen when it did? Several factors went into the making of that. First was new technologies, new inventions. Um, that is a lot of times what spurs a major change in economic or industrial growth is inventions, technologies. And we can think about that throughout, and there's great ways to contextualize that. You can think about like the computer age and like the, the computers and the internet from the 70s to the 80s to the 90s and all the growth that that will then push later on. Um, you can talk about energy or transportation of the 1900s, you know, from the automobiles to planes. And there's a huge growth of technologies in the late 1800s as well. One of the big ones was dealing with steel productions. We've always had iron, but iron's weak and brittle, and you can only do so much with the material iron. When you can convert that into steel, a much stronger and long-lasting material, there's so much more economically you could do with that. And so the Bessemer converter, which allowed these industrials to take iron and mix it with other elements and making it into this stronger steel was huge. Uh, also, if you're gonna deal with large quantities, you need to be able to heat it adequately. So the open hearth furnace um, was created to make these large production molds of steel. And you see, uh, this is the best converter, extremely large. And those are the open hearth furnaces right there. And we see a huge steel industry rise up. Um, again, the focus is going to be actually in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. That's where the, the mecca of steel production is going to be. 
So Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania will become this hub for steel production for many reasons. One, just is proximity to these great coal and iron mine supplies. So that's one thing. Also, it is the crux of two different rivers. So there's two different rivers that sort of get flow right into Pittsburgh. Also, its location on the map. You look at Pittsburgh on location, you look, go back, it's right there. So it's sort of in between the Midwest cities of Chicago and Cincinnati and Cleveland, Detroit, and also the East Coast cities of like Philadelphia and Boston and New York. So it's a nice halfway point. Uh, so there's a lot of rail lines that link up Pittsburgh as well. And the person who's gonna make Pittsburgh really become um, as large and, and strong steel-wise as possible is it gonna be this captain of injury, I'm sorry, captain of industry, Andrew Carnegie. Um, he is going to really push the steel production and making one of the really first monopolizations in the American history with the steel business. Uh, we're also going to see the rise of petroleum, um, and which is oil. And at this time period, oil was not needed for cars because there was no cars available yet. There was no really invention of cars. But what oil was needed for was lubrication, uh, especially with the lubrication of all these new industries, machines that were going online during the industrialization. Also, kerosene um, was, was going to be used for lighting as well. So that's going to be another byproduct of oil. One thing that was not used in oil was gasoline, uh, which, again, which is a waste product before it was used for automobiles. Okay, a couple other uh, new transportation methods will, be, will make this time period even more booming. We'll see the airplane and the automobile both come into line at the very end of this time period. Uh, obviously, the automobile is going to be extremely big by the early 1900s. It was just a novelty in the 1800s, though. Uh, Henry Ford is going to be a really large producer of cars. And really what he does, and this is really important to know, that he uses this concept called Taylorism, which we'll talk to you a little bit later on. But you basically creating a very uh, productive, efficient system of assembly line production, um, making like uh, basically the the industrialization as scientific method option. So what he does, he instead of having uh, people move from park to park to park, he actually creates a movable assembly line to sort of move the car through the factory. And so the people that are finishing the car just leave, need, to, need to stay there and the car comes to them, makes it extremely efficient, and brings down the prices. And you see there, the car is on the conveyor belts. And of course, planes were really big at this time period too, not in commercialization or not in really practicality, but the concept of trying to fly was a sort of a novel thing. People are trying to be like the first ones to truly fly. That's not just in a hot air balloon. Um, the two people who were able to invent the very first plane was Orville and Wilbur Wright in North Carolina. And they flew that plane, the Kitty Hawk, uh, which was a, um, a, a biplane that was able to get off the ground for a few seconds before then it had to land again. Um, also, we see start seeing um, companies push, putting and pushing for research and development um, and really sort of like trying to get new laboratories and new things online to be able to then advance their technology, advance their businesses. Uh, we also see higher education start catering not only to just do the traditional classic um, uh, subject matters like theology and philosophy and English, but more towards research and really pushing to sort of develop a new wave of researchers, a new wave of scientists, a new wave of developmenters to really make new and improvements to the factory system and to the products those factories are making. And this is where we talk about this Taylorism, the scientific production. Uh, so, so Frederick Taylor um, was a industrialist who really came up with this idea of scientific management of the factory. And he had several things to make the factory more efficient. Um, the first thing was subdivising the tasks. Rather than having a worker work on several things within one product, a worker should only work on one single thing. So really just streamline that work into very unskilled labor, but then something can be repeatedly done over and over and over again. 
Also, workers would be using modern machines uh, to help increase the speed of their tasks they're doing. It's going, to, it's going to increase the productivity. You're going to be able to take the skill out of the job, so that means that it can be much easier to hire new laborers uh, when needed. And also, you're going to have, um, as a owner or a foreman, you're going to have much more control over the work that's being done, and much more like a beginning that you're taking the skill out and you can control the production means. And like we said, the movable assembly line by Henry Ford was built in 1914. And what it did, it really just cut down the time it took to make these automobiles from 12.4 hours to down to 1.5 hours. So obviously the cost is going to dramatically decrease as well. Okay, um, at the time of industrialization in the mid 1800s, you know, right into the Civil War, we're going to see railroads becoming the, you know, they already had become the really large, uh, important transportation hub, but it's going to exponentially grow as well. So railroads are going to be extremely important to get the industrialization and to get all the different things rolling as much as possible. Um, and they're going to be built just exponentially fast across the nation, mostly in the Northeast, but also you're going to see it's, they're going to be moving westward as well, you know, in several different transcontinental railroads. And even the South is going to get some more hubs there. Um, Chicago is going to be an extremely important city in the Midwest. It's going to be a rail hub for all these Western routes. So therefore, we're also going to see Chicago grow as the major city in America rivaling New York City. Um, also, if you look from the second map, you see all these lines that are going to be going into the Midwest, all going to Chicago. Well, all these lines from Texas and Oklahoma and Nebraska and, and Kansas are all going to be filled with food. Again, a lot, of, a lot of grain, but also a lot of cattle as well. And Chicago is going to be the, the hub for the slaughterhouse in industry because you can see all these stockyards going into Chicago to be processed for the population of the East Coast. This is the stockyards of Chicago right there. Um, also, trains and the, the, the railroad industry is going to create time zones to make um, the process of timing trains and station times and all that stuff being very exact science. Uh, so that's going to help speed up productivity as well. So that's where we get our time zones, our four uh, continental ones, you know, Pacific, Mountain, Central, and Eastern. And what we call these railroad tycoons are robber barons. Um, there's sort of two ways to call them. They're going to be called captains of industries or robber barons. Um, the, what a robber baron is, is basically a entrepreneur, an industrialist that uses the um, political scheme and the political times that were, that were in the late 1800s and really trying to sort of manipulate the market, manipulate the economy, almost to a very greedy, corrupt way, but again, all legally to sort of make the most out of their wealth and what they can make out of it. Um, so railroads sort of took advantage of the customer, took advantage of the consumer, took advantage of the small shipper um, to make and maximize their profits. Uh, so they're called robber barons, almost in a very negative light there. Um, and you see Cornelius Vanderbilt, Jay Gould, uh, call us the Huntington, the three top railroad robber barons. You see here, um, them sitting on a stack of money and really what's pr promoting and trumping them up is all the labor um, that's going to be, um, you know, sort of the back of the their money's built off this labor. And we're going to see the corporation rise up in this time period. Uh, we're, again, you don't really need to know this LLC, this limited liability corporation, but we start seeing corporations form into these large conglomerate organizations. Rather than being owned by just one person, it being owned by a series of stockholders and shareholders, where you would have the public start investing uh, into these companies. The reason they do that is to basically raise capital so they can invest that into research and development or to expansion. Okay, now we're gonna get into some of these industrialists, Robert Barron's capital industry. Andrew Carn Carnegie, probably one of the most famous one, came from Scotland and got his start in the iron business. And he made huge amounts of money 
basically something called vertically integrating his company, bringing in all stages of production of his company, going from the mines themselves all the way to the marketing and the shipping agencies of his product, which is going to be steel. Um, so he's going to buy up and he's going to really buy up and this steel mill. So what really makes the raw materials into a finished good. But then he wants to have more control of his company. So he starts taking over different parts of the production line of steel. So he, you know, he starts buying the coke fields and the iron ore deposits. He buys the steel mills. He buys the shipping lines. He buys the railroads. So everything that makes up steel, he owns, which allows him to have a greater, um, a greater, uh, basically, a. Uh, um, control of his production, making more money. So this is one way to monopolize a company, is vertically. And we see here with Carnegie, he is not owning all the um, refines or all the mines, all the transportation, but he owns everything that makes up his steel. Thus, he can then now sell his steel cheaper and start buying up other steel companies as well. Another way to monopolize a, country, a company is through horizontal integration. And that was something that was done by John D. Rockefeller to a perfect T. Um, he formed Standard Oil in 1870 in Cleveland, Ohio. And what he did, he started to buy up oil refineries and oil refineries and more oil refineries. Eventually, by 1880, he owned over 90% of all the nation's oil refineries, which was huge. And then by doing that, he was able then to sort of like um, get shipping lines then give him rebates and discounts to allow him to then buy up more oil companies. Um, and that's something called horizontal integration, where basically you're combining the number of all the same firms or all the same like ideological industries. And that's called a vertical monopoly, I mean a horizontal monopoly. And that's a way to look at it, where he would basically own up all the different refinery companies. And this is a great cartoon where you see this standard oil monopoly, and it's sort of like almost like octopus, where it's controlling the small oil companies and the saving banks and the gas companies and the insurance companies, and it basically controls all little parts of society. Eventually, it's going to get so big, by the early 1900s, the government's going to come in and crack it down. Um, and when they do that in 1911, we see it's going to start, you know, being forced to sell off a lot of their different uh, oil companies and form different oil companies, which you see in you know, the, the likes of Chevron and Unical and ExxonMobil and BP and whatnot. And here's some of the benefits of horizontal integration. Uh, it obviously lowers the costs, increase the pro product's differentiation. Um, it obviously reduces industrial rivalry's ability to compete. And it has huge bargaining power among the transportation networks. And what he was able to do is then form a trust, uh, which is basically a legal way to monopolize a, co a company. And the master of forming trusts was a guy named J.P. Morgan, um, who will be uh, some, a banker who was able to like, buy up companies and then sort of put them together into these mega companies. And he'll do that for, uh, he'll actually buy Andrew Carnegie's steel company and will eventually form the largest U.S. company ever built in that time period, U.S. Steel. Okay, eventually this, this whole aspect of capitalism will come to crisis. There's flaws with this, okay? And this whole idea of this, the myth of the self-made man, um, this whole aspect of that, that every single person could be, go from rags to riches, but basically you could go from a humble beginnings to a, the richest man in America. And that is sort of true, but most people would have almost zero chance to do that. Very, very hard to do that. Um, and typically, these industrialists use the system to make their wealth. Like again, they use the laws that were in play to make their wealth. And we see here, basically, all these big robber barons, all these big captains of industry, using Congress, using the Senate as their, their guinea pigs to pretty much make sure that they don't pass any laws to regulate their companies. So there was a big thing during this time period where we were in cahoots with this, the Senate and the big companies were almost like working together. 
Uh, the Senate wouldn't really pass any restrictive laws that would go against the companies, and the companies would give huge campaign donations to the senators. And what we call is a social Darwinism, where basically we have Darwin's principles of evolution, basically with the survival of fittest. And what we do is adapt this to both business and society, that government should not step in to basically, you know, trump up or help smaller businesses that are failing. Uh, they shouldn't step in to help society or people out that are failing as well. If you're, if you're not, you know, if you can't make enough money for your family, well, maybe you shouldn't have a family and procreate. Um, if you are a business and you're losing money, well, maybe you should be swallowed up by the larger monopoly. Darwinism, right? And there's a great cartoon for that. You see John D. Rockefeller with Senator Oil, all of his competitors, or these leaves. In this cartoon, what does this figure, John D. Rockefeller, represent? And what he does represent is a robber baron here, not a philanthropist, not a Euromanthropist, but a robber baron, uh, basically, you know, picking the buds off the you know, of all of his competitors. But you also have the reverse side of that, where these guys made so much money that they really thought, especially Andrew Carnegie, thought that it was their duty to start giving away that money to philanthropy. Um, they thought that they were the best, they they were the best minds in America, and that therefore they know where that money should go to, uh, where it would be best used. So the thought was is not to give the money back to the poor. Don't don't raise wages. Don't give them food. You know don't you know just give them like you know the thought because again. If you give a man a, a sandwich, he'll only eat for a day. If you build a library or a school, then they can learn to read, learn to be more educated, and then make higher wages themselves. Uh, so they would you know, use their money for flash you create libraries and colleges and concert halls and parks and universities. And many of these rich men gave, gave away huge amounts of money. Um, some synthesis or some like current day um, uh, philanthropists could be Warren Buffett or Bill Gates of uh, you know the 2000s. And we see here Andrew Carnegie basically with his huge amount of money giving it to all the different libraries, you know, opening it and making libraries across the country. But then you have the reverse side that he's willing to give lots of money out to uh, libraries and society, but at the cost of the labor, basically saying we aren't going to raise your wages because we don't have to because there's so much surplus of labor. So it's sort of a double-edged sword. Yes, he's giving away lots of money to charity, to philanthropy, to libraries, but why does he have that money? How did he get it? Did he get it through, through being fair to his employees? No. But again, he wasn't breaking the law because there was no minimum wage, there was no uh, standardized working conditions, there was no safety and sex inspection, stuff like that. So he wasn't cheating the worker, he just was sort of being immoral to the worker, not giving the worker what he probably deserved. Is he giving away and making libraries and concert halls? And another um, author of this type of he was Horatio Alger. And what he wrote about is rags to riches that basically with a little bit of hard work and a little bit of like pizzazz, almost anyone could rise through the system to become better than their, their place in life at the start. Uh, so this was a, a lot of allure of this for this American dream that anyone can come to America, be born in America, and then rise up to become more wealthy or more um, you know, acclaimed, you could say. Okay. And then some different visions uh, besides that one. Um, you have Henry George, who wrote Progress on Poverty. And what he did, that basically put down monopolization and the poor treatment of workers. Um, you have Edward Bellamy, who wrote Looking Backwards. And this is basically a young man who went to sleep and woke up in 2000 to a new social orders where want, politics, and vice were unknown. So basically, um, sort of like both criticisms of this time period. And you start seeing the problems of this monopoly. Obviously, on one hand, you have these captains of industry, these, these leaders of industry that pushed it to allow America to grow exponentially, allow mass production uh, to, to give products for the first time to people uh, that never had them. It brought the cost down so people could start finally affording goods, not just the rich. But at the same time, there were robber barons 
where they use this laissez-faire government, ruthless business tactics to drive out competitions, and also not really care about the workers or consumers within the, who they would hurt on the way. So again, these are some of these robber barons or captains of industry. You could basically make an argument for all of them. And we'll have a debate about, are these guys robber barons or are these guys captains of industry? Which one are they? And to rise up against this, we are starting to see workers starting to be really taken advantage of in this time period. So one thing, we see a huge wave of immigrants coming into this country from the Eastern and Southern Europe, these new immigrants are called. Um, we're gonna see basically a flood of Americans from the West and the South sort of flooding into urban areas for jobs. You're gonna see 25 million immigrants that are coming from like Russia and Ukraine and, and Slav and Greeks and Italians and rushing into the East Coast cities and the Chicago's and the Cincinnati's, uh, settling these, these ethnic ghettos um, and again, it's flooding the market with labor, which wasn't a bad thing for America as a whole because we were expanding so much. Obviously, for the American-born worker, this made wage earners really be forced to sort of accept lower wages because there was so much labor available. And we see here the new immigrants from Central, Eastern, Southern Europe all really started coming in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, they'd come over here and they would uh, land in Ellis Island first in New York and then they would take trains or and to other parts of the country like Boston or Philadelphia, but most sort of in the Midwest, like Chicago, Cincinnati, Detroit, uh, Cleveland, Indianapolis, places like that. And we're gonna start seeing major nativism, uh, again, sweep across the country. Also, we start seeing the working conditions get really, really low but with a flood of labor and more um, skill taken out of the job. We see factory workers making dirt wages, you know, $500, $600 a year. Uh, we see factory uh, workers being able to be fired for pretty much anything because the boss can just hire new workers. Um, it basically was a six hour or a six day a week job for you know, usually about 12 hours a day. Very unsafe working conditions, very no safety regulations whatsoever. There's child labor, uh, women labor in very uh, you know, drastic situations. So extremely, extremely bad conditions. I like this because you see basically the low wages and high rent and, and bad working conditions really putting clamp on workers. And of course, you know, again, child labor was something that was sort of a double-edged sword. It was good for the immigrants, it was bad for the immigrants. It was good because many immigrant families needed all members of the family to work to make ends meet. Obviously bad because children are more prone to accidents, they're more prone to um, getting fired or being abused by uh, older workers or employers. Also, they should be in school too, of course. And so we're going to start seeing workers starting to unionize, but it's going to be a real struggle. Early on, you're going to see very weak unions, not very big ones, and typically these unions were going to be short-lived. Um, Molly McGuire's, you may see that on a test, it was a very militant group. Um, probably not, though. You may see this on test as well. The really first big national strike was the 1877 railroad strike. Um, and it was spurred again by wage cuts. And this became a national strike where basically strikers stopped pretty much all rail service across America. Um, and what eventually will break it is the federal government coming in with troops to break the strike. The um, justification that uh, President Hayes stated is that, that since the trains were a vital form of our commerce and our transportation, and they cross state boundaries. The government can actually come in because they were dealing with interstate commerce, and they they are the rights to control that. So they have the rights to come in and break the strike up. Uh, the big thing you should write down is that this shows us that the government was going to be on the side of the the owner the and the railroad over the worker. Uh, you're going to have our first major national 
uh, union called the Knights of Labor. Um, and that's going to be about a million people eventually. Eventually, it is going to have a downfall, though. Um, once the Haymarket Square riot comes, uh, they're going to be unfairly and unilaterally targeted for that. And they're going to see the sort of the death of that labor union is going to be, be on, the, on the downward decline because of that. Then you will see the American Federation of Labor sort of take over the Knights of Labor. Um, Samuel Gompers will become his first president, and they're really going to focus on bread and butter gains. So they want an eight-hour workday. They want better working conditions, and they want higher pay. Really, that's it. They want those three big things. And there's three big strikes you should know. You should know about the Haymarket Square Riot, a failed strike in Chicago at the McCormick Harvester Company, where the strike will basically branch out into the streets and form into a riot. Um, the Chicago, Chicago police will come in and try to break it up, and uh, a bomb will go off there, and several police officers will die. And they basically target the union for the cause of this. They target the union for the, the doings of this. And they actually will then arrest several anarchists, and they will use them as a scapegoat for the bombs going off. Then you have the Homestead Strike, which happened in 1892 at Carnegie's Homestead Steel Mill. Um, at that time, his manager, Henry Clay Frick, will, will be forcing wage cuts on his worker. Uh, but at the same time, they're not going to lower their rents or prices of goods or prices of food within the community. Um, and so this is all during a national panic as well, the Great Panic and the, you know, the crash of 1892, 1893. What's going to happen is that this, the union of the steel mills can go on strike. And what the company's going to do, they're going to call on strike breakers called Pinkerton Guards. And they're going to come in and they're going to basically try to stop the workers from, um, you know, uh, causing damage at the facility. What's going to happen, though, the Pinkerton Guards are not able to stop the strike. So that they're going to basically request assistance and militia from the governor to put down the strike, which, again, tells us the government will always get involved on the side of the owners over the workers. And you get the last strike of the 1800s that's really significant, the Pullman Strike, another company in town, where they made basically the Pullman Railroad Car. And what happened is that basically the panic caused it, this again, for the company to basically cut wages. But they weren't going to cut rent costs or food costs. And so the workers went on strike. And they actually got the help of the railway union as well, who promised that they would not service any train pulling a Pullman car. A Pullman car was basically a sleeping car. And so pretty much every train had them on them. But also the trains had on them were mail cars. And so what President Cleveland did, they basically got the U.S. Army involved to basically force the strike to stop because he claimed that the mail must go through. You must service any train with a mail car on it. Otherwise, that is a crime. And so they're able to basically come on the side with the railroad company and get the strike to stop. And we'll discuss all these cartoons on Tuesday. But that's it. That's the lecture. Uh, we'll see you uh, on Tuesday, guys. And please write some questions down that we can answer on Tuesday as well. Have a great evening and a great day.